This is The Extra Mile. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Extra Mile. I'm Caleb Spear along with... G5. And right in the middle of us in the studio is John Heatwell. He serves also as one of the ministers uh, here at the Milwaukee Ave Church of Christ. That's right. And we're going to be grilling him with all the hard questions. He's got the wisdom. He's got the experience. So we're expecting all the answers, John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank it's, you for coming it's on. It's donut time. <laughs> That's right. That's if you right. want one, just say it. Can you pass me a donut in the middle of this thing? I will. Yes. I guess it would be only fun for the... I'll just throw it at you. Yeah. Yeah. People could get a kick out of that. Or they can listen to me eat my donut right in the mic. <laughs> stop. We're not here for that. <laughs> John, how are you doing today? I'm good. So, uh, John, he is going to be giving us his life story and testimony and faith in Christ. So, George, you're running the show today. <laughs> We're going to be going off of you, man. That's okay. That's okay. We thought we'd bring John on because he has maybe a unique experience, and he also has just a lot of experience in ministry as well, and, yeah. and a lot of experience just dealing with people. We've been talking a lot about communication with others, with God, with how we present ourselves on social media, and I thought John would be a great one to come on and talk about you know, how we deal with people as well and his, his story and how he came to Christ. So we're going to try to dive into it and, and kind of look at John's life. But to give some background, I know that you, uh, you've been all over the place. You have went to ministry school, and uh, you've been preaching several years. Just give us a little background on, on who is John. Well, how far back do you want me to go? Yeah, where were you born? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was born in Lahana, Colorado. <laughs> Unless your social security. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just back up. <clears throat> I was raised on a farm in southern Colorado, and um, it was a good life. We were uh, part of a, the Mennonite church, went to church. Yeah. Every Sunday. Put that well, put that microphone up to your mouth there. Most most Sundays. Yeah. There you go. And uh, so anyway, I grew up, you know, in a religious home. And, oh nice. Uh, so I've always known about God. I can't remember not knowing about mm. God. So my parents were a good influence that way, as far as that I knew there was a God, and I knew there was heaven, and I expected to get there. Mm. at an early age. And uh, I want to say this little story. I might have said it before in a sermon or something, but when I was probably five or six years old, I remember standing outside the Mennonite church, and it was a fall day, and the leaves were on the ground. It was I was just standing there by myself, and I said, I'm going to go to heaven someday. I don't know why that's still in my head. I remember what I was doing. I remember it's like it's like a determination. I want to go to heaven. Wow. My old and I five or six, somewhere in there. Wow. I wasn't in school That's yet. That's so cool. And so <clears throat> that memory has popped up in my mind several times uh, along the way. But anyway, um, so we went to church, and then uh, not real, I wasn't committed to anything really that way. But So in my teen years, of course, I did what a lot of teens do. I started drinking. Mm. and doing some other things that weren't good. And uh, in the meantime, my brother Mike, who's a very big part of my story, he had been in the very worldly as well, but he uh, had a Bible study with uh, two of his friends. We weren't really friends that much, but they also grew up on a farm right away, right across the stream from us. We had a huh. creek that went between our farms, they went to school in a different district than we did. So we didn't really know them. We just knew of them. It's interesting that those two boys, the Holmes brothers, had a Bible study with uh, the preacher in Lahontic, Colorado. And my brother took part in that. <clears throat> and they all became Christians the same night. They were all baptized into Christ in 1975, I think it was. Wow. And hey, so all, all three of them. Wow. And uh, one of them went to preaching school like right away. Wow, wow. that's so cool. And so <clears throat> here we have these brothers, two sets of brothers out on the farms. We didn't really know each other, but it's interesting how God works in lives. And it reminded me of Matthew when Jesus called. I just found the scripture, but um, when he went and he saw Peter and Andrew casting nets into the sea, 
And he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they left right away and went. Later on, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, in the boat, and Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left their boat and followed him. So we're not, you know, James and John and all that, but it's just kind of interesting. You have brothers and brothers. And I, it, to me, that's a unique story for us is that <clears throat> there's, and all four of us became preachers in the Church of Christ. Huh. So it's kind of a fabulous story how... Yeah, I see the similarities. A bunch of farmers instead of fishermen, you know. Yeah. Start, start <laughs> yeah. <that>. Anyway. <laughs> just put down your, your yeah. hose and your, yeah. your rakes yeah. and yeah. just went down. Put can down I the tractor. A, let me get a quick interjection here. Do, you could you just really quickly summarize um, the beliefs or theological differences between Mennonites and the Christians, those in the church? I've been asked that several times. Right, because you were going to the Mennonite church, right? Yeah, that's yeah. where we were. But yeah. at that point in my life, <clears throat> when, I, when I was young, I didn't know that much. At that point, when I was converted, mm-hmm. we were in a different denomination. Oh, we had okay. left that when I was like, I don't know, third grade. Oh, pretty oh, wow. young. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I didn't know really much about that. And and I don't really want to say much about that that's uh, fine. faith at this point. But yeah, I would say that they're rather conservative, and they did— give me a start in my belief system. That's a good yeah, thing. So, mm-hmm. That's a good thing. So anyway, when I was a teenager and doing stuff I shouldn't do, my, during that time, my brother became a Christian, and then he was very evangelistic-minded, and he tried to get me to think about my soul. And he did That's what smart, I call the— Smart brother. Yeah. <clears throat> well, he was trying to call me, and he wanted me to be you know, a Christian. But he would work on me by saying, John, you want to come over and eat? And, of course, I like to eat. And he was just a single guy at the time, and he'd always have a bag of Fritos. So I call it the Frito Ministry because (laughs) I always liked Fritos. And I I said, oh, you got Fritos? Okay, I'm coming over. And so I go over, and he would uh, ask me hard questions like, if you were to die tonight, are you ready? (laughs) Oh, man. I mean, he's pretty— He went right to it. Yeah, he just right in there. I mean— but he asked me other things, too, but he was just trying to instill some questions and doubts. Trying to get your mind centered yeah, where it should mind. be, yeah. And so I would, you know, it, I've always had, a, I think, a pretty good conscience as far as I'm moldable. Mm. But I was hurt, you know, I would, it would hurt me, and I would, like, I'd feel the pain of knowing I was wrong, and I'd try to be better for, you know, another week. He, you know, then I'd go back to the same old thing. So you know how it is. Yeah. Anyway, he did finally go to preaching school, and uh, then I, during that time, of course, I was doing things. I was not being a Christian, but I was going mm. to church. And during that time, uh, a momentum thing happened to me. I guess a kind of a Jesus come to Jesus meeting thing mm-hmm. was actually at a Pentecostal revival <laughs> <laughs> that was right across from the church where I was attending. And uh, we just got through with this uh, Methodist Youth Fellowship time, and one of my buddies and I, who was also my partner in crime, we decided, hey, let's just go check out this meeting across the street at the high school, and so we did. And it was the dad of one of our classmates who, him and another guy, always did these, or often did these meetings where they would, you know, play guitar and an accordion, they'd sing some songs, and they'd... And they would preach, (laughs) preach, you know, uh, they were, you know, more of the Pentecostal movement. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so my friend Donnie and I sat towards the back of the auditorium and we're just like, oh, no, we're going to hell. (laughs) Oh, no. And we both were scared. I mean, it scared us. And uh, I made a life change and he made a week change, you know, a short time change. Mm. But from that time on, I was like, now I'm ready to listen to my brother whenever he will talk to me. Whenever he's preaching, yeah. And so when he came back, you know, that summer after he was at preaching school, then we had Bible study. And August 11th, 1977, at 11 p.m., I was baptized into Christ. Wow. That's so cool. And another thing that's cool about that is, <clears throat> so he taught me, and one of these other guys taught me that I was talking about one of these neighbor boys, they're, not, they're men, uh, the Holmes brothers. And I have great respect for them, and and uh, they really influenced me greatly. I mean, they were like my heroes 
young heroes at the time. Oh, wow. And they had taught somebody else who also grew up on a farm right down the road from us <laughs> by the name of Dave Malott, and he's the one that baptized me into Christ. And so <clears throat> have a lot of, you know, emotional ties there. Yeah, it all just kind and, of ties together real well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing because he was a farm boy right down the street. He actually went to school with the Holmes brothers. So Wow. Anyway, so our story is all interconnected. And then, uh, uh, so anyway, what I'm saying is they, they taught me and a great influence to me. And then later on, I, w- I went to preaching school, but I was reluctant. I was one of those persons that would say I would never preach. I could never yeah. do this. I could never do that. Now, after you were baptized, was the, was the life change easy for you, or was it hard to grow, or was it— well, it wasn't hard to grow. It was it was a challenge because I was actually living at my mom and dad's house still. I was 18 oh, nice. years old. Okay. And uh, they uh, were quite disappointed in me. Really? And uh, it was a shock. So when my brother became a Christian, he was trying to be evangelistic to them. And, and so a lot of walls were built, barriers. And and I, uh, I just, I went that way too. And, oh, and it, it was hard to... Uh, you know, sort out how to how to deal with all that. Eventually, I moved out and moved in with uh, Dave Malott, the guy that baptized me. Oh, wow. Okay. They let me live in their house for a while, and then then I went off to uh, Abilene Christian for a year. And uh, anyway, to move the story along, you know, later on, uh, I got married to my wife, Carol, and uh, so... We moved all over the place. We lived in Tucson, and and that's where I got the conviction to go to preaching school. Was uh, Tucson? <clears throat> and yeah. What was that conviction? Well, part of the reasoning there was uh, we had a couple young preachers there that were quite opposed in their stance in the doctrine. <laughs> one was more liberal. One was more um, <clears throat> conservative. And the main preacher had left, so it was kind of like what we have. We had like, we have like four preachers, three full time, oh, and then wow. you have me. But there they had three. Yeah, you had a youth minister, a prison minister, and the pulpit minister. Right. The pulpit minister left, and then the other two took over the duties. And you hear one sermon, and next week you hear a different sermon. It's like they were conflicting. It's like, what's going on here, Caleb? That's okay. What, <laughs> what in the world? What are and you uh, no, so anyway, it was you. quite. Uh, confusing and frustrating to me. And anyway, I just, it was just the right time that it convicted me that I need to know more Bible. I was not yeah. learning mm-hmm. as much. I, I couldn't defend my faith. I right. couldn't, I was too shy to speak up in Bible class and say, I don't think what you're saying is right. And I didn't know how to back it up. Mm-hmm. And so things like that helped me say, I need to study more. Yeah. And uh, so we went, I we went to Bear Valley. How long were you at Bear Valley? Uh, it was a three-year program. Cool. Right on. So, and where in Colorado is that? It's in Denver. Oh, okay. Right in Denver. Yep. Yeah. Nice. And was that pretty intense? Uh, quite intense, yeah. Three-year program. You go to work or go to school at 8, maybe get home about 4, and mm-hmm. you have to work on papers, uh, mm-hmm. study, memorize. Uh, you also would preach when you could. Do you miss that formal education at all? Uh, no. No? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I loved it. It was three of the best years of our lives, but... Really? Oh, yeah, it was awesome. But same yeah. time, you have to you have to leave the fold and get out there and, and do something. Yeah, yeah. That, the academics are important, but you got to get out there and, you know, <clears throat> do. Right, <laughs> and right. And learn. Yeah, so our first it. work was in uh, Ephrata, Washington. Wow, that's way up there. Yep. I've, Where is that in relation to Seattle for those who are looking at it? It's uh, about three hours east. Okay, so way out there. So and it's two a hours, beautiful country, though. Yeah, two hours west of uh, Spokane. Okay, I know where that is. All right. right on. And how long were you up there? A uh, total of 11 years, oh. but not all at the same time. Oh, okay. So I went up there. We went up there, and I preached for like four and a half years. And we from Was there, that full-time? Yes, full-time. Okay. That was full-time. That was full-time. Then from there, we came to Texas for a couple of years. They went back and just did full uh, part time. And then before I keep going, I'm interested in all that. Um, what was, if I can go back to your baptism real quick, what 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 was it personally for you that was convicting and realizing I'm going to be baptized? Like for example, 
Caleb was kind of a skeptic about the Bible and stuff like that. Other people, it was just, you know, you know, show me the verse. Other people, it was kind of more conviction of their own status. Like, what was it for you that convicted you? Um, well, basically, I knew I was a sinner. Yeah. I knew that I was, I used to pray after I, when, even when I was, didn't have all my senses, like when I was, had been drinking, I would pray, God, keep me alive till I can change my life. Really. Oh, wow. wow. I mean, I knew the whole time I was wrong, but I still did it anyway. And I didn't know how to escape it until, you know, the gospel plan was presented to me. So that is when, a, it, when I was ready, it's like, okay, I'm ready. And it was after a Bible study at night, and it was 11 o'clock when I was baptized. And here's another thing I want to interject is that mm-hmm. in that congregation in La Hanna, Colorado, even though it was 11 o'clock, there was probably 30 or 40 people in uh, in attendance. Oh, wow. Some people got on the phone and said, John's going to be baptized. And they were there. And people got out of bed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember how they all looked, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, but they came and witnessed that, and That's it was a, a very emotional time. I, I cried like crazy, you know, yeah. coming out of the water. So That's a beautiful story. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I mean, so sin is what convicted me, you know. And I, yeah. my brother had given me books on evolution versus creation. He gave me a lot of things to read before yeah. I actually became a Christian, and and uh, and afterwards, and so I I spent a lot of time reading in my room. My parents thought I was crazy because I would just sit in there and read, and I that's not me. I'm I'm not a reader. So anyway, so those all those things built up, and I say, well, we're not doing this at our congregation. How come? That's what the Bible says. Or we're doing this, and the Bible says don't do that. And so all those conflicts help me say, I need to follow what the Bible says, yeah. regardless of what my parents. Or anybody else says, it got you in the word. Right. You have a you have a yeah. dual right. you have a dual lesson there of what Jesus talks about, like Luke fourteen about the cost of discipleship with family. But you also have the evangelistic uh, domino effect, if I can call it that, too, with your siblings, with your brothers. Right. Where you saw what evangelistic mindsets can do with the power of of the gospel. Uh, that's interesting. Those two uh, up, up and personal in your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can be. Very convicting, very convicting. So once you started preaching, I mean, what was that like? I mean, moving from Colorado to Washington? Uh, it a was a world? whole new world. Really? I mean, I was when you come out of preaching school where you have preachers everywhere and and close fellowship and right. everybody's like, amen, and we got really? this going. Everything is, you know, ooh, we're, we're going to go get them. You get up there and small congregation. We had a couple elders, which I'm very thankful for. They protected me a lot from the wolves and uh, expectations that are unrealistic for a new minister. That's helpful. Uh, That's nice. Yeah, so they were a big help in a lot of ways that way. Yeah, and uh, That's crucial. But it was it was hard. I mean, I was like, I kept looking at my notes like, what am I supposed to do? I'm a minister. I'm a preacher. And then I kept looking at my notes. I had a class on, you know, the work of a preacher. And I, I opened that notebook over and over again, which, by the way, was a class— um, taught by the preacher at Bear Valley at the time, Don Cantor, who was also the preacher in Lahana, Colorado at the time that I was baptized, who was the guy who baptized my brother. Oh, yeah. So I had that connection up there, too. It was really nice to be able to visit with him from time to time. And so, but he was a very evangelistic man and uh, awesome influence in my life, so... But anyway, he had that class, and I would look at his notes a lot. And try, what am I doing? And uh, but it was a, it was a great place uh, to start. And what I found is uh, in that area, uh, the church is not real strong. There's not a lot. It's not like down here in the Bible Belt. Mm. And uh, you had we had a very small church, and it's like I got to get to work. Yeah. What are some of those differences between the Bible Belt and? And not the Bible Belt, I guess, and experience. Yeah, well, obviously, less Christians. Really? Less churches. Um, when you find a Christian, it's like you latch on to him. It's like, really? Oh, you remember wow. the church? Awesome. I was like, mm. it's kind of like, you know, Denver Bronco fans when you see wow, them. Wow, builds a deeper connection. Yeah, you have this. I don't, know, I don't know about here. that analogy. You know? <laughs> Are you a Bronco fan? Yeah, we, we're, we're tight like this right away, you know. But up there, I mean, when you find a Christian, 
And I'm not saying there's not any. There's, there are, but it's just way fewer than down here. Hmm. Now, are there, um, any, are there any pros to that environment? Because I see the cons of being widely outnumbered. Were there any? Yeah, I, th- I think the pros to being up there is we actually had more of a mission mindset. Really? It's like yeah. we're in a mission field. We may be in the United States, but if this church is going to grow, we're going to have to talk to some people. Right. We're mm-hmm. going to have to convert them. And so God did bless us with uh, opportunities and, and meeting people. And I think part of the success we had was based on our age, uh, God using us where we were as young mm-hmm. families, kids in soccer, kids in sports. We make connections with other people and able to invite some to church. Some we just had able to set up Bible studies. And mm. and then it's just like in Matthew 28, you know, you, you go and you preach, you teach, and then you teach them to be able to observe all that. And they go and do the same. And we could see that domino effect, that leavening effect, that Yes. Salt and light. It just kept moving. Other hmm. young people would talk to other young people, and and the church was like this able fire. to grow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, disciples make disciples. Right. So that, that yeah. keeps so we could through. see that there was you know disciples making disciples, and it was it was fun and exciting to see God working in that small church. Yeah. And when you come down here to the Bible Belt, it's almost like you let your air out, and you it's like wow they're everybody's a Christian down here, which is, you know, is not true, but <laughs> right, it's right, like right. You, you see Christians everywhere and churches me, everywhere. Yeah. I was, I was shocked when we, when we moved here, we came here from Scotts Bluff, which again is where's that Northern Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Oh man. So we preached. George, are you familiar with that? Uh, I've been to Nebraska. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And I've, it's, it's just like nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and how long were you there in Nebraska? Uh, I preached there for two years. Okay. But then from there we came down here. That's but a anyway, huge difference. Yeah, it's a huge difference. When we came down here, it was like kind of a shock, and it was re- refreshing, and yet I would say a negative that a person can get is the more relaxed mindset that it's not as urgent. That's exactly how I, I felt here, where I was like, it's really nice to have so many Christians, and mm. you know, in a city like Lubbock where we're recording, um, people have kind of that family godly mindset. There's lots right. of churches, but yeah, the urgency is always something that that is very different here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is, you know, of course, all of us have to think and realize there's lost souls everywhere. Right. But it's just easy to get comfortable in this uh, setting. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt that for myself that I haven't been as evangelistic minded uh, in Lubbock, and that's my fault. Uh, up there, it's like you just feel like we got to we got to do something. So right, right. It's more. It was more pressing. Of course, when I was a full time minister, it was like I wanted to, I wanted to do good. Now, as you dealt with more people, and you look at the two types of people and their different life experiences throughout the country, what was more appealing to them? What was more appealing to Christ about to them? Was there a difference there, or what wasn't appealing? Or, yeah, or what wasn't appealing. <laughs> Uh, well, that question is, I think people are the same really anywhere. <clears throat> um, it's kind of like the parable of the soils, you know, some people are going to be ready, some aren't. Um, their backgrounds all take, uh, make a difference in what they think. Just like my mm. background helped me sure. to always know there was a God. Some people, their background is steeped in, you know, more, I don't know, maybe Catholicism or, mm. and... And I've dealt with some of that, <clears throat> so I, I don't I don't really know how to answer that question. Uh, yeah. You just got to my my experience is everybody needs God, and you got to find a place to start with them. Mm-hmm. And the place to start is not confrontation. Mm-hmm. It, the place to start is to try to be a friend, be sincere, be real, be genuine, be loving. You know the. the the fruits of the spirit. <laughs> if we don't have the fruits of the spirit, we're not going to convince people. Oh, yep. man, growing up, uh, for those of you not watching, I'm wearing an <laughs> Angels jersey. There you go, John. You wanted, you like the Astros. You need to repent. <laughs> you cheated. Anyway, um, but outside, you know, ballparks where those Dodgers, Angels, or other places have been at, you see the people with big, big signs, 
and they have like the repent or perish and they got like the microphone and they're like, we're all going to go to hell. Like, and that's like that, <laughs> that's like the mindset. And I'm, that, I like what you say out of Galatians five, like if the fruits of the spirit are not in our witness, our evangelism, our proclamation of the gospel, right. like, like which is just, that's really bad. So I, I pre- that's really good advice. We need to have the fruits of the spirit. We're stealing that from John from now on. You got to have the fruits of the spirit when <laughs> you're evangelizing. Otherwise, Cru- there's no meaning in that. A crucial. Yeah. Well, another thing is try to find something in common with people, and right. that's right. that was where I was. I think God helped me to to see just whether it's soccer. You know, my kids playing soccer. Your kids playing soccer. We were on the field together. We we right. spent a lot of time with other soccer parents and they all knew we went to church you know and they we would be late for games because we were at church and then we would go to the tournament you know things like that but they knew and but throughout those situations we were able to talk and uh some people believed and some didn't believe it reminds me of the the sermon in in uh athens or was it mars hill yeah act 17 yeah, you have act all 17. the options laid out right there yeah, all the options some sneered some said we'll listen more and some followed and that's kind of the way yeah. it is anywhere we live exactly yeah. the, the the key is trying to find a connection where you can offer them uh an opportunity to, to hear. so correct me if i'm wrong but we're hearing we can be intentional in our day-to-day lives and interactions with people I think a lot of times people hear evangelism and they think of what I just said of not saying it's inherently bad, but street preaching or door knocking, which may have its time and place in certain cultures and, and you know areas. But you're talking about intentional day to day running to people, you know, at the grocery store or or you're saying your kids are a good one. Right. I yeah. need to have kids just for that. Yeah, have, some, have <laughs> some kids. Have a quiver full of them. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. But, I mean, really, it just – where you're at in life, it changes. As, as we get older, we have different connections. Right. But yeah. during that time when we first started in the ministry that uh, the young families and uh, the kids were a great tool. I mean, I, I, I don't call my kids tools, but – They're arrows. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a tool, they were, right? <laughs> they were helpful, and they didn't even know it. But, yeah. you know, just for instance, you know – I want kids now. Just I got for two instance, arrows. you know, you got to look for opportunities. Yeah. Eric's soccer coach, when he was a little guy, uh, went to a different denomination. They didn't use their Bibles. They just listened to creeds and stuff like that. And we got a conversation going. He said, "Well, John, are you one of those preachers that preaches hell, fire, and damnation?" I said, "Only when I need to." <laughs> and uh, he ended up coming to church, you know, quite a bit. So. I like that. He, yeah. he he didn't he didn't make the conversion, but uh, he was interested. And so you just wherever you're at, you just try to look for things. Another person that became a Christian and he's still a faithful member of the church. Uh, he came out of Catholicism. Uh, we played racquetball at five in the morning. Oh wow! And I oh, am not a morning person. Oh, but it was you would do things like that. If you have a connection, if there's something you have in common, and mm-hmm. that was the only time he could do it, so that's what you do. That's what you did. And my, and I, I didn't preach to him. He ended up asking the questions. Mm. Right, right. And I was able to talk, and we ended up having Bible study. And well, that's and the thing. Sometimes people helped. don't want to be yelled at; they want to be talked to. Right. And, uh, and if you can build that relationship, sometimes, <laughs> pretty much all times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, so sometimes true. my daughter. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, that's so true. Building that relationship. Now, once the gospel sets in, how do we make our faith our own? It's kind of this action point as we as we wrap up here. Well, every person has a journey that they go through. Yeah. And you don't just have faith like that usually. I right. mean, if you saw Jesus do a miracle in front of your eyes, it may dramatically change you, just like, you know, Saul, when he saw Jesus yeah, after, you know, I mean, he's like, Boom, I got to change now. It's maybe not always that intense, but even after you make a decision, you have to keep studying, you have to keep growing, you need the fellowship with uh, the family of God, you yeah. need the church. Um, I had a, a lot of people help me with my journey, and I'm still growing. I My faith yeah. in God is real, but I still have room for growth, and uh, a lot of people Amen. have helped me. Uh, my brother helped me. Uh, the person that baptized me helped me. And when I first became a Christian, the preacher helped me. 
Uh, there was elders that were great examples to me that I still appreciate deeply. They're just genuine, genuineness and mm-hmm. yeah. kindness, having me in their homes, um, which is something I just want to put a plug in. We need to have people in our homes. Yeah. You know, it's God's homes. And uh, that's how we we connect with people. And if we can get some non-Christians in our homes, we can help. And uh, God can use us. They got to see that we're real and that we're open. So. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I'm hearing the, the church has, it may look different in different environments and cultures, but it has to really, like you're saying, genuine. I'm hearing family. We need each other, right? It's, right. you know, First Corinthians 12, Romans 12 idea, the body. Um, everyone's going to have the role to play, you know, in such growth. And I'm always encouraged, you know, still and as a younger person for sure, um, when I hear older people who are wise, like yourself, saying, I'm still learning and growing, mm-hmm. that sounds really exciting to me, that that's how deep um, the knowledge and relationship with Jesus is. It's really yeah. cool. And I, I can I can say the same thing, and I can be encouraged that you had so many influences in your life, John, because you're now an influence in my life as well, um, as both Caleb and I uh, are in the ministry, and it's been it's been great. I think of John and I think of Barnabas, someone who encourages and someone who's there. Yes, yeah, you're definitely a Barnabas. Yes, well, I want to be. Yeah, <laughs> you're my favorite Bible character. <laughs> yeah, he's a good yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's a wrap. Uh, right. I hope you guys got something out of this. I know I did. Yes, I and am. just talking with people, loving people, and uh, and sharing the gospel message because it's the same message, and everyone needs Jesus. Amen. Thank you, John, for coming good. on. Thank you. Thank really you. Enjoyed it. Go so. See ya.